For many entrepreneurs, changing businesses or adding on different products can be overwhelming or sometimes even a sign of failure. Today's guest is going to show you how you can change and grow in your business and have different income streams and also be really successful at it without giving up and without burning out. Join me in this episode of Real Biz Talk. This is a really good one, especially if you're struggling a bit with showing up in your brand and creating a social media presence. It's wonderful takeaways, really quick tips. I think you guys will enjoy this episode. Welcome, Sarah, to the Real Biz Talk podcast. I'm excited to see you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I I am so excited. I have been chomping at the bit all day to get you on here thinking about what we're going to talk about because everything what you've done in entrepreneurship really targets in what the listeners need to hear and see that you've done successfully. Let's start kind of with your background. You were working normal type of career, nine. I wouldn't say nine to five <laughs> necessarily, yeah. but nine to five. And then you, you know, carved out your own piece to the entrepreneurship pie. And that has changed over the years. Let's start with kind of what got you even out of your career and into entrepreneurship. Yeah. So I actually went to college right out of high school and got my nursing degree. And I was, I believe, four months pregnant with my oldest when I graduated nursing school. And so I hopped right into parenting and nursing all at the same time. I had three kids in four and a half years, and it was my 20s were a lot. (laughs) And (laughs) I love it. (laughs) I mean, to say the least. But as I, I really enjoyed my career, I always wanted to be a nurse since I was very young. But as a working mom and nursing hours are not normal, they're Mm -hmm. really hard. Early, you know, when you work a 12 hour shift, you're really not home for like 15 hours that day, right? With Mm -hmm. travel and all the things. And as my kids got older, I realized that I needed to make a change because I was missing so much time with them. Mm -hmm. And I was having a really hard time juggling both motherhood and my career. And I felt like something had to give and it wasn't going to be my home life. So that's kind of how I started to make the pivot into being a business owner. That's cool. And your very first pivot was into being a photographer. Yes. Yes. So what got you into that? You know, we had just a little point and shoot camera and it broke. And uh, that was about the time around 2010 that everyone was getting the DSLRs, right? So when I started too. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That was like the time that was the birth, right? Of these mom togs or whatever we call them. But we got a really small tax return. It was maybe like 2,500 bucks. I remember I took exactly $333 and bought a camera. I remember because that was so much money for us at that time. And it really was a good portion of that tax return. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I've got three kids. My youngest was a year old. I was like, let's just see what happens. And I started posting these awful photos. They really was not good at what I was doing. But you know, I was having fun. And I started posting them on Facebook. And I started to get little messages here and there trickling in. Could you maybe photograph my family? And I was like, well, this is fun. Mm -hmm. And let's just kind of see where it goes. And the snowball started right then. I love it. We're so similar. And it's funny when you said 2010, I'm like, oh, goodness, our paths were like aligned parallel at the same time. We have a lot of photographers that listen since I'm very heavy doing legal work in the photography industry and obviously the photographer as well. So that's cool. How long did you do photography for? I'm still shooting. You are even now. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's right. You um you have a studio that you're renting out. Yeah. So that was a really exciting thing that happened last year. So I started sharing a studio with five other people. We each paid like a hundred bucks a month. Mm-hmm. And you know, that was that was a big expense at the time. You know, when you build your photography business, it's these little small gains, right? And these yep. little expenses. So last year, I was able to build out a second studio. So I have two in the same building. One is more uh, like content creation, business meetings, more of that. And then the other space, the downstairs one, is more newborns, family lifestyle. And I rent both of them to locals in the area. And it's been a great way to keep photography income generating and still keep my clients around. I shoot maybe two, three times a month still. Nice. Yeah, yeah, that's that's incredible. Yeah. And I also 
similarly did that with my photography studio, moved into full-time renting it out as I transitioned more into doing the log talk and this podcast and everything. But I think it was a great way, you know, much like you, I didn't start with all this money to invest in business. My DSLR was a Christmas gift. And my husband jokes, it's like the worst present he's ever given me. But I'm like, look, <laughs> like, look what has come from like just the camera. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think that's great. You know, there are potential issues of sharing studio space with people. But I, you know, we hear horror stories. Maybe I hear it more being the lawyer in the photography yeah. industry. But I think it's a really great way to when you're getting into business, whether photography or not, right, of being able to what expenses can be shared and really what can you bare minimum work with. And I, it's so easy when you look around and you're like, oh, they have this massive studio. They have this. They have that. I, you know, I don't have that almost the imposter syndrome, right? And I find those that do much like what you just talked about, what I've done and others, is they were smarter in the sense of sharing the expenses. It increases your profit margin, which also allows you more time for your family and yourself. And yeah. you get a community out of it. And I just, I love that approach to it. And I just wish more people in any industry would really embrace that kind of you know, my mindset about opening up my studio to other people was I remember what it felt like to barely be able to scrape together that hundred dollars a month to pay for my shared rent mm -hmm. and being able to be that hand. But also I have met so many people in the area, not even photographers, but mm -hmm. boutique owners and realtors and other business owners who've come and rented the space. And we've created a relationship that way. So it really has been the sweetest, like cherry on top of mm -hmm. my photography business. I feel like I get the best of both worlds, right? I have space for my clients and then I have a space for other people to be. So it really has been probably my favorite thing to come out of my photography business in the recent years. And while I was getting ready to ask, like, what are some lessons from the photography business that you've carried over into some new and exciting fun things you're doing now in addition to photography? But I mean, it could be good lessons, bad lessons. This is a good one. Obviously, networking, sharing, getting the community, cutting expenses. So maybe you have a negative lesson that you learned that you fixed now for to not make again. Well, people aren't intentionally damaging to personal property, right? Yeah. It's not an intentional thing. But I've learned mm -hmm. that my contract has to be pretty clear Right. I didn't pay her to um, say that. I promise. She's not prepped yeah, for that. No, she didn't. <laughs> but my contract has to be pretty clear on the expectations of you're renting the space for a half day, for a full day. It needs to look like X, Y, Z. Here's what happens if furniture is damaged. You know, and so that's been a learning process for me because I understand no photographer goes into there with a plan to break a chair or a leg off a couch right. or whatever it is. So that's been a learning experience. Obviously you know, messes here and there. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's been overwhelmingly positive. But there are those little like, you know, kinks in the day where I'm like, oh, man, and now I got to go back and read my contract and remember what I have in there. And there's all these little expenses. I was actually thinking about this. I ordered something at a restaurant with over the last few weeks. And it was incorrect and I took it back and they gave me something else and they threw that one away. And it got me thinking about how much waste and it needs to be factored in, in like, you know, wear and tear, whatever industry that you're in. I see this especially yeah. with uh, fitness gym owners, you know, the wear and tear that they're going to have on the facility, incorporating that into pricing. And you don't really think about that. When you first get out, you're like, okay, here's the shopping list. Here's the money I need. Okay, I'm good to go. That's my cost. And you really have to consider, you know, if you're in food, uh, waste when you have to remake something or your employees drop it on the floor inadvertently. Or like you mentioned, like a chair gets broken intentional or not. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, the best thing that I've learned as a business owner is being able to be as fle so flexible. Yeah. So flexible in all things like the finances, right? Or, you know, those little expenses or just dealing with people in general, the flexible flexibility and being able to pivot. Yeah. Are, are two really important things about owning businesses. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot since we are okay. similarly aged here. And I've okay. been noticing this. And when my team watches this, they're going to have a field day with what I'm about to say. I am an old dog. I'm not that old. But it's really hard. I find as I'm getting older, that flexibility aspect is I have to be more intentional about it. And it's almost like I get into this mindset of this is the way I've done it. I want the control this way. 
if the example is yesterday we were on a call with our social media team to help me get the content out because I was the roadblock, which is why we hired somebody. And they're in the team saying, oh, hey, let's do this and that. And I'm feeling the angst and anxiety. And I'm going, no, I can't. And I never really had that in the beginning. I was open. Maybe it was the age because we were in our 20s. Uh, yeah. and now I'm later 30s. So do you kind of have that same feeling? And is it maybe because, I don't know, for me, I'm like, well, I've done it. So I know it should work, but that's almost being blind to the changes that are happening. Like this instance was about Instagram, which we'll talk about yours here in a minute. The hardest thing for me has actually been communicating with clients and customers. I want to do email all the time. I want everything to be on my email. I love a good email thread to see kind of what were we talking about. I can reference it. No one's doing email anymore. <laughs> Nobody. It's like, I'm out here by myself. Like, guys, come on. Email's cool. Let's all do email. No, it is project broadcast. It's texting. It's DMs. It's, I mean, everything I but. <laughs> everything but. And that has been one of the hardest yeah. things for me. Like, I just turned 40 last month. So I get it. Like, we are we are getting in that old, older, older. Yeah. And I'm like, but email's cool, man. I love email. Let's do email. What's your email address? Everyone's like, Sarah, no one's doing email anymore. You got to get over it. You got to move on. <laughs> so what I did was I talked to my kids. I have three teenagers. My kids are very helpful in that communication yes. area. And then I talk to people who do what I do that are in their 20s. Mm -hmm. And I, I delegate. I ask them for help. Mm -hmm. I say, what are the trends? Where is this going? And then whatever they recommend, you know, you find someone who's better at something than you are and take their advice. So I am starting to implement these little changes. <laughs> we make a support group so we learn to kind of let this stuff go and implement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I get it. I totally get it. Well, you know, I will have mentioned on other episodes and you probably feel the same way. I kind of miss the early stages of business, you know, no matter what industry it is in, because it was in when we got into business, it really was right before this whole cusp of um, freemium information. Like I had started originally on MySpace, then Facebook, mm -hmm. Pinterest wasn't a thing, Twitter maybe, but it really wasn't on the map. Definitely wow. didn't have Instagram. Yeah. And podcasts weren't as big. So I had to like figure it out on my own or else you had mm -hmm. to like schlep down to a conference center and spend thousands of dollars. Like that was the only real access to learning how to do business. And so I kind of miss those days of doing that. And I'm trying to remind myself like this. Okay, listen to what the team is telling you. Embrace it and use this. You, you say all the time, Rachel, you miss that period of time. Well, here's another period of time of growth. It's like you're starting a new, quote unquote, yeah. because the, the time's changing. Yeah, it really is. Isn't it bizarre to see what's changed in 10, 12 years with mm -hmm. social media, especially um, Instagram? has taken on an entirely new life in the last three years yeah. than from when we started using it. You know, it's, it's a very interesting mm -hmm. thing to watch this happen in real time while you're running a business and learning how to pivot and take advantage of the changes without being so yeah. frustrated. The changes just keep coming consistently. You just gotta do it. Honestly, yeah. I get left behind. And I've seen that in my own social media presence on certain platforms being stuck in my own way. I've gotten left behind in some areas and now I'm having to sprint quicker to catch yeah. up. I do want to talk yeah. about your Instagram because that's how I found you. Obviously we're in this age of TikToks and reels and I could fall down a hole and spend six hours just watching them. You uh -huh. are pretty committed to primarily just reels all the time. How do you come yeah. up with the creative putting yourself out there and making that connection. Cause that's really what I love. I mean, you're successful, you've done it really well, but I love the engagement and connection you have with those that follow you. Like what's your secret sauce? I hate that term. I don't even know why I just used it. <laughs> <laughs> what's been a really hard pill for me to swallow is that stories were my number one, like revenue generator. Truly stories were so successful for me for many, many years. And Instagram decided, hey, we don't want you to share stories anymore. We want you to share reels. And my stories views tank. I mean, tank. And they're still low right now, very low. And it's like, okay, I have to play the game, right? A lesson my dad taught me right before I went off to college that I will never forget was he said, you play the game your professor wants you to play. Yep. No matter what. 
Yep. You just suck it up and you do it. And that's a lesson I've carried with me my whole adult life is when you don't make the rules, and especially when you're using a free platform, this is free. This is not anything that I've paid for with an expectation of whatever. Yep. Okay, so I'll do reels. So my first thought was anything that I'm going to do as a story, I'll just make it a reel. So a lot of times I'll record a series of stories, just save them to my phone and then upload it as a reel. So the the effort and energy is still the same. Mm. The hard part is figuring out how long do I need to make it? What does my hook need to be to make people say, oh, I want to listen to what she has to say Mm. and the text part? Because back in the day, the text was with your with your photo post. The photo had to be beautiful and the text had to be poignant. And now it's what can you say to me in seven seconds or less that makes me want to stick around? And I talk fast and I have difficulty with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it has been a learning curve for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I do always think from the perspective of a consumer, a potential client, a potential customer, a potential business partner. And I think if I was watching my content, what I enjoy it, what I feel like I added value to that person. And that's what I think. And I know that the general rule is one reel a day. I don't do one reel a day. I don't. I should, but I don't. I don't. But I do a really good job of on days that I actually get ready, which working from home, that's not every day. No. I do a really good job of (laughs) banking content. Yeah. So I'll be intentional, record things to share later, record on the fly. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's a learning curve. I'm still learning, but I threw my hat into the game and was like, I'm going to try to figure this out and see what people want. And again, I'm also learning from people who are younger than me doing well on TikTok and reels as well. I ask them, what do you see to be Mm -hmm. successful for you? And then I'll implement those changes. Let me ask you this. I just had this conversation. I have these mini like freak out moments. So like my team members that have been with me for years, they're just like, oh, again, right? The new ones are like, oh my God, what's happening? Rachel's melting down. But <laughs> I, we had this conversation very in line with like reels and TikTok. And because I'll go in spurts where I'm like, record, record, record. Then I'm like, yeah. I don't want to touch it. And I asked my team, I said, because my birthday was last week, I turned 38. And I said, Am I getting too old for this? Like, I'm not the cute. Like, it was easier, quote unquote, in the beginning. Of course, it wasn't reels at the time when I was having babies. And I even just talked about this on my Facebook yesterday. I was a lot more relatable when I'm having babies and I'm able to talk with people. And I guess now I still can make connections with having teenagers, et cetera. But I just, is there, you think we're going to age out of these trends for social? I do not believe you'll ever age out of adding value to other people. Say that again. You'll never (laughs) age out of adding value to other people. And that's That's the whole show, folks. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, that's (laughs) that's really because, um, you know, yeah, my kids were younger when I started my businesses and people could relate to me having young Mm -hmm. kids, being a working mom with young kids. It's very lonely with teenagers. And we are all desperate for connection of women who are raising teens so we can add value to each other and running a business, thinking forward with college applications. I just had a breakdown about FAFSA the other day. Like what even is that? Right. Mm -hmm. I have a senior this year and you make this whole new connection. And you can keep adding value in all sorts of ways. Maybe I don't show my kids as much because they're older and they have that privacy to themselves. And they're not as cute. Love you, you know, kids. they just are their <laughs> own person, you know, and they're like, you don't need to share everything that I'm doing, you know, yeah. but the um, intentionality is still yeah. there and adding the value will never change regardless of our age. I love that. I want to actually back up a little bit. Something you said when we first started this conversation about Instagram and making the pivot with reels and playing the game, Mm -hmm. you, one of the big trip ups, and I see this in myself and I've heard this from others that I coach in business coaching. They're like, but I just don't know how to do the reels or I don't even know what to put into it. And you said, I just, I'm paraphrasing, but you basically said, I sit down like I'm going to do a story, but I make it a reel. And so that almost was freeing a little bit for me because I've started doing that process where I just sit down again. I built my business really on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And at the time, we didn't have all the bells and whistles we had now. So it was very text-based and with a still image. It wasn't a lot of video at the time. And so I'll even do that now. I'll go ahead and write it as though I'm going to post as a a static 
text and then yeah. move into creating that into a movement or real. Um, so I just, for me, that was really freeing. And then the second thing you mentioned, of course, is always, what does the consumer want to see? I am the worst at this. And I think it's because with me teaching legal, like I'm to bring to the table, you guys don't know what you don't know. That's what I'm here for. But at the same time, I need to remember that I have to package it, not the way that I want it, mm -hmm. the way that you guys want to consume it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a weakness for me. Do you have, do you have tips for me on that, Sarah? Yeah. Um, <laughs> my social media is not for me. Yeah. It's just simply not for me. It is a service to others. Yeah. And when it's a service to others, then it does make it easier to not make it about me. Yeah. And if I'm always thinking, who am I going to be able to impact today? Who's going to learn something new because of what I'm putting out? I'm able to make it less about me, more about mm -hmm. them. And that does make that process easier. Yeah. And so little spoiler, Sarah's coming out with a clothing line as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about her entrepreneurship journey. But I bring that up now to ask you, what is Reels with your face in it is working across all these industries? Like how imperative is your face being in all these businesses? People want to know you. And they will accept you and every project you're working on if they feel like they know you. So you is your face and your voice. And I know that's hard, especially as you age. Okay. It's not always <laughs> easier yeah. to show your face when you feel a little bit droopier and saggier than you <laughs> used to. But the yeah. connection, you know, it's not face to face. It's screen to screen. So you have to put yourself out there. It, hard. Like there are people out there that don't want to see you succeed or that they have a critique of who you are and what you do. But for the most part, yeah, your face has to be out there. I'm sorry to say it just is yeah. a thing now. The other side I see that people get wrapped around and I do this too, even with um, recording is you want it to be perfect. And I'd go back to the days when Instagram was brand new, my babies were little, and you didn't really mm -hmm. have to have this before the perfect IG feed, right? Which is all nope. kind of going to the wayside now. Mm -hmm. But you could throw, that was when I was building the business. I had, even though I was a photographer, I wasn't a good of a photographer. Mm -hmm. um, I got better, but I was just throwing real pictures up, not R-E-E-L, but like real life pictures. Yeah. And it's easy now to get wrapped around. I don't have a videographer. I don't have this. I don't have that. And I think putting the imperfect out there is way better than it being perfect. In fact, I sat down the other day because I was having my own pep talk about recording. And I thought to myself, have you ever unfollowed someone because they were laying in their bed talking about something? No, all you cared about was what they were talking about. What they had to say. Yeah, yeah. it's true. You know, done is better than perfect. Mm -hmm. And I do attribute my years of working in trauma nursing to what I'm able to bring to Instagram. That job is messy and very, very imperfect and done yeah. is better than perfect. I'm not a perfectionist by nature either, mm -hmm. but I appreciate done over perfection because mm -hmm. truly perfection is a myth like motivation. It doesn't really exist, right? Yep. We like to think that, but it does not. Yep. So whatever content you can put out there, you are still running laps over the person who spent four hours editing one video that's never going to make it up. And the way I always tell myself, like on the one that I recorded yesterday, the angle's wrong, the camera's shaky. And I was like, well, I'm out of time. I got to go to my next meeting. I'm just going to post it. I said, I can always archive it later. Uh -huh. But it's out oh, You there. won't need to. You won't need to. Because thanks to Insta or TikTok and Reels, yeah. imperfect is what people are craving to see. Yeah. Well, the outfit choice wasn't the best. I had to take <laughs> captions and like overlay a very discreet area so you couldn't. <laughs> oh, well, that happens too. That's it's okay. all right. But I mean, <laughs> you know, if I had just looked at it and been like, oh, screw it, it's got to be perfect. It wouldn't even be posted. It would have been done. One of the best things you can do is set a time limit on the time you have to create content. So right before this, I told my husband, I said, hey, I have to record a clothing try on for this other brand. Mm -hmm. I have 15 minutes. I'm going to knock it out. Just don't come in the bedroom. I'm doing it there. <laughs> and I knew I had 15 minutes to knock this out before this. And, and that was cool. So if you give yourself those little time limits too, you mm -hmm. won't overdo it. You won't overthink it. Done is better than perfect. And then you've done that job too. There's yeah. a time and a place for beautifully crafted and curated content, but it's, it's pretty rare, truly mm -hmm. these days, you know? 
So are you applying the done better than perfect mentality as you're moving into this clothing line creation? Yes and no, because it is, it's cus- there, everything is customized down to the eighth of an inch of a fit. Okay. So I want it to be as perfect as it can be right. for the customer mm-hmm. while still getting it done. I could take another three years curating and building this. I'm right. not going to. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of a fine line there. The one thing that I, I won't compromise on the way it makes me feel, because I know that's the way it's going to make the customer feel. So it's there's this fine line of perfect. And this is a completed product that I'm proud of. Right, right. Well, so, and yeah. actually, we can circle that back to reels. If I watch it, And I'm like, oh, I really missed a key piece. I'm like, okay, I can either make a part two or I can scrap it. But if it's, oh, your hair is out of place here, you have a glare on the glasses, you know, that's the differentiation for me is it's the content in the way I wanted to say it. Is it going to be received that way? Is it educational? Whatever it is that I'm doing versus more of, I know clothing line is different for aesthetic and fit, but as far as on reels, the aesthetic, it's almost looking at it and go, and I do this with my legal clients. When we're in negotiations, I'm like, what are the concessions you'd be willing to make? And the concessions should be how you feel you look. Truly. Mm -hmm. It really should. It's the content. It's the verbiage. It's the message you're getting across that matters more. People are way more forgiving of what you look like when you're putting content out there now more than ever. Yes. Even five years ago, you had to be the prettiest with the best outfit, with the best look uh, for your photos. And it is not that anymore. And for that, I am grateful because it really it didn't lower the bar. It just set it more at a reasonable level for everyone to partake. As we age. <laughs> yeah, right. Perfect timing. <laughs> Great timing for us. Oh, buddy. So let's talk a little bit more on the Instagram, kind of like with followers. That is, yeah. you know, you have a lot of followers because you have really engaging content. Um, I'm going to point blank ask you, is that converting to compensation? Are you making money? Followers do not equate to dollars in your pocket. Yeah. Followers is exposure, which is great, right? Mm-hmm. We like people to be exposed to what we're putting out there, but really it does not you know, okay, yeah, I guess you could say if I had a million followers, my clothing line would have more exposure and maybe I'd have more sales, but maybe not. Right. Because if you have a million followers, but you have no engagement and you don't engage and who knows, maybe some of those followers came from someplace irrelevant anyway. Yeah. I think the most important thing people need to realize is that if you have more engagement with a thousand followers, you're doing better than the person who has less engagement with a hundred thousand followers. Yeah. So the follower count, although you appreciate it because it means more people know who you are and they're seeing what you're putting out, it doesn't equate, it doesn't convert the way that you would imagine it to convert. Mm-hmm. And that's a hard lesson because numbers are what drives everything in business. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So I don't want to say it's irrelevant, but I do want to say it does not may- mean your sales are automatically going to go up. It does not mean that you're going to convert a higher percentage than someone who has way less followers. Yep. But it does mean that you you have a platform that you can use to your advantage and add even more value to the mm-hmm. people who have come to sit at your table and say, show me what you got. Glad you said that. I actually had a business coaching client who was the whole influencer look all when it was perfect, you know, wonderful amount of followers and ended up with a line at Target. And Mm -hmm. I don't want to be too specific because you could probably figure it out. But they're coming to me going, I'm not making any money. I mean, there's the collabs that they were doing, but with like, um, you know, paid for clothing and that kind of stuff. But the actual line that was being sold at Target, a couple other stores it was like bare minimum. And then she was also doing sales online. They were not converting. So it was all mm-hmm. these followers who loved the fashion and it was not directly converting. And it, it, it she was kind of sold this idea and not by me. Um, so yeah. this idea that you've got the followers and we kind of said it a little bit earlier. So I'm glad we're clarifying this. They see you, they trust you, they'll follow you from project to project, but not 100%. And her idea was they loved and they were buying through like to know it, you know, the affiliate links, making money that way. Surely they're going to go buy something with my name on it. And it was like a cliff drop for her. And it was a rude awakening for business and the changes there. 
And I don't bring this up to say, I don't think this is going to yeah. happen for you. You're very savvy. The clothing line, I think it's going to be wonderful. And you have the head on the shoulders you've already said. I'm not, ex- not paraphrasing you. I'm not expecting for my followers to automatically equate the clothing line mm-hmm. success. You know, you're still going to have to beat feet in order to get that to, um, for the clothing line to be successful. You know, I feel like that's a really good lesson for entrepreneurs is that not every business venture is going to be a success. Yeah. Maybe you have to, maybe it fell flat, but for a very simple reason. So start asking your followers, what is it that you want to see? Like that's Mm -hmm. when you're pulling information constantly from the people who are invested in you, you got to remember what they say, what they want the changes they'd like to see. So, you know, being self-employed is this ebb and flow, this up and down, this roller coaster of life. (laughs) So while it hurts desperately to see a project that she probably poured a lot of love into kind Mm -hmm. of fall flat, you know, it's maybe just a lesson in, okay, I can do this better in a different capacity. Let me go back to my people and see what they wanted to see and tweak things. It's a hard lesson, though, when it's it just, you know, and you can't predict it, Mm-mm. I don't no. think. You know, I, a lot of people don't really know this. I have written children's books. I have seven of them now. I haven't had to think about it. Cool. I went into that project because it's something I wanted for me. And I didn't really source for my audience, do you want this, do you not? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I went in with the expectation of, and they're kind of modeled after my kids and they're modeled after things I do. So there's a photography one. Uh, there's a triathlon. I've got fostering and adopting dogs, all the, all the things really in my life. Yeah. And so it was almost, it's a project that's for me with no expectation and the sales are great. Of course, I still did the regular numbers of, you know, what is my time investment on this? Is it financially worthwhile? Yada, yada. And it was worthwhile in that it takes me longer to get a book out than for my project with that expectation of my own personal stuff versus if I was actually trying to sell it to my audience, I would be cranking through trying to get it done. Whereas now I know I need to be doing revenue generating activities in the meantime, Uh which takes away from writing the books. Do they sell? They do okay. (laughs) They do fine. They're on Amazon. They're on my site, all that. But I don't really, when we're looking at financial projections, that's something I always wanted to do was write a children's book. Mm -hmm. And when we look at financial projections, I don't even include that in the goals at all. That's just a good to have. You know, and I think that's good. I did. I actually did the same thing. I wrote a cookbook. Okay. I was twins from like, yeah, right. (laughs) It was for my son for like graduation. These are all the recipes I made for you growing up. And, and I was like, you know what? I can share this. This is a personal project that I'm just making public. And if people buy it, great. If they don't, great. This was for me anyway. And then there's hobbyist income, which I think is great. I don't think every single business venture has to be your number one earner, has to be six, seven figures a year. You Mm -hmm. have to love what you're doing. And if you can make money doing it, then that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And having all these little projects that are like, what fulfills you at the end of the day? Is it something that's huge and income generating? That's amazing. Is it for you and any income you make from it? Thousand bucks a month, maybe 2000 bucks a month for something you were going to do anyway is great too. So that, that opinion that you have of it being whatever it is, it's for me, it's because I enjoy it. I think that's a very healthy and like entrepreneurial mindset. Now, but I didn't have that in the beginning when my family needed the money, right? It was very much, I had to baptism by fire, figure it out. So there was a period of time that I didn't have the luxury. Mm-hmm. When I say luxury with air quotes, because I worked to be able to create that luxury, mm-hmm. but I didn't have the luxury of being able to do a project that would take my time away from revenue generation. But it was putting the supports in place that allow for what you, you know, what you mentioned, hobbyist income. And I think it's kind of the same thing. And we were talking about this before we even started recording. Oftentimes, entrepreneurs will get into business, either whether it's a project, it's the whole business, and there's life circumstances. You have to keep working something you're, you know, in something you may not love and you want to pivot, but because you need the money, we'll make a plan to get out of it. You know what I mean? Start slowly building something else as you can in transition. You may not be able to just, and we see this on Pinterest and Instagram. If you don't love it, don't do it. Well, I don't love paying my bills, but I have to. My kids like having a home and food to eat and especially teenagers. But I, I, 
you know, and we, we hear the colloquial, failure is great, you'll learn from it, all of that. We've even kind of mentioned that here, but I think that it's, that is almost an oversaid statement that's not given enough attention by entrepreneurs to really understand little failures on projects. You do have other things going on too, right? You should always be evaluating what you're putting your time and effort into. Do you, what, where are you at in life circumstance now? Are you needing money? Well, then you don't have time to go write the children's books because you need to be doing something that's going to get yeah. you money now. Yeah, there is, you know, all these heart projects that I call them. Those are the gift for the grind. Mm. That is the result of that grind that took years where you were up till 4 a.m. and then went back to work at 7 a.m. the next day for three, four years. There is a gift that you have given yourself when you've done that grind. Now, the whole thing, what did you say about failing? I think where people forget about failure is you fail upward, you're still succeeding. Mm -hmm. So it's all about that mindset of the failure and the grind and the sacrifice is required. Mm -hmm. But if you fail, the question you ask yourself is, are you failing up? Are you failing while you're climbing up the stairs, right? Or are you really failing at all? I mean, so I'll... I think this is the first time I've ever shared this transparently. You know, I have different brands in different silos and they all kind of run the same. We've got the same back end processes for the most part. It's all adapted to the niche that it's in. I had set up one for bloggers back when blogging was really a huge thing Mm -hmm. and it didn't really get off the ground. So at the time, I even found myself saying, well, it's a failure. It's a failure. But then I looked at it and realized I didn't go through my own tried and true processes. I was like, well, let's just throw it up here and see what happens. So was it truly a failure? I mean, on paper, it failed because it didn't really make money. I closed it down because I was taking my eye off of the other you know, revenue just generation brands and businesses. But I didn't really fully give it the the, um, I was going to say gusto. I didn't really give it the attention that it needed to even see if it was a failure. No, I know what you're saying. I think failures are, it's just a lesson in the, on, on the journey. It's not, a failure does not mean quitting. So that's the most important thing. Whether you view it as a failure or, or everyone else says, no, this is just part of the creative process or the business building process. What do you do with it? Mm-hmm. And then that's where, it gets into the whole the, the self-development aspect of being an entrepreneur, which truly is the most important thing. And the people yeah. who are most successful are the ones who are most developed in that way where you don't see a failure as as failure, as quit, but you see it as just a necessary bump in the road towards what you're working on. I chuckle because I often sit back. I'm very contemplative about looking at, you know, what I've done in business. And I just remember in the beginning, it was very much, I need to know the mechanical process. I got to nail this down. I got to do this. And how much, once you kind of get that under control and you can fine tune it, you move into that stage, what you just said about like self-development and being able to, and I saw this in leadership of having a team, right? I have Mm -hmm. multiple employees and God knows how many contractors. And In the beginning, and I've shared this publicly before, that leadership and management has been one of the hardest, two of the hardest, because they're not necessarily the same, two Mm -hmm. of the hardest things for me. But it was because I was in that phase between me by myself, very mechanical, and then realizing that I needed to improve on self-development. And once I embraced the self-development side of things, not just the leadership and management became better. And I'm not perfect team. You're watching. Yeah. I'm not, I'm getting there. <laughs> I am perfect. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but once I really started embracing that self-development, I think it's easy as entrepreneurs when you're first starting out, there's so much that you're trying to get, you know, you're trying to carry all of this and you're like, Oh my God, one more thing. I got to go learn how to develop myself. I wish I had done that self-development sooner. I used to think self-development was a crock, right? I was, no one, no one's talking about that in nursing. No one's asking you what your self-development journey is. Other photographers don't care because they're working on generating their revenue. They're not helping you develop your sense of self. And I was like, I don't know what these people are talking about when it comes to self-development, but mental strength trumps business knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. It really, truly does. And That's where it really, I started to see the shift in my businesses. My businesses became more successful. They generated more revenue. I was open to failure more. More people were learning from me. I was mentoring more business owners when I learned that 
once we can get it right up here, the process is so much less painful and you'll see more success because you are so strong up here. And it's a beautiful thing. It really is. I love that you said that because I, I felt that myself and I still, so even when I get anxiety driven. I'm like, you know, I start getting fear-based decision-making, which is horrible. (laughs) But I know in the beginning, like I was very fear-driven because we needed the money. Um, I was going through cancer treatments. Husband was deployed. The one that's 17 was just a baby when I first started out. So that was even before photography. And so a lot of decisions were very fear-based and I had failures in there. I had successes in there. But like you just said, it would make it a lot less painful if I had had that self-development side. And there's so much information out there. It's almost a disservice these days. So how do you find this resources for self-development? Like, where would you tell someone that's like, all right, Sarah, I'm sold. You know, I've been in the mechanical process as a business, but I'm ready to do self-development. Where would they start with that? Because it's almost like this ethereal, go develop and learn yourself. I know. You don't want to be too woo-woo about it, right? It has to have practicalities. My number one recommendation is the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. Yep. Love it. I mean, this book changed everything for me because it gives you the practicalities. It breaks it down into like bite-sized pieces. And you start to learn how when you have your mind right at Mm -hmm. getting that 1% better every single day, it's you against you. Everything else about the process starts to take shape and yeah. make sense. Yeah. So that's, you know, you don't have to listen to all these love yourself podcasts or you are the boss babe of the world. Like that's not even what I'm talking about, right? No, I'm yeah. talking about how can you get mentally strong so that you know that you are able to achieve everything that you've set out to do. So or, that's my number one. Or, when your stuff fails because it is mm-hmm. going to fail at mm-hmm. some point, it's not as painful like you said. Absolutely. 100%. That book really changed my life in so many ways. And it actually gives you a pass. You give yourself way more grace when you start to realize, hey, it's not, it's not, you know, yes, entrepreneurship is hard. It's going to be hard forever, but it's not, it's not supposed to be this burden that constantly weighs you down, you know, and it's, it's a journey. You know, yeah. but it's there's so much beauty in being self-employed too. And I hate for people to miss out on that part of it. You know, sometimes I've had business coaching clients that will come to me and they're like completely burnt out and they go, oh, I just don't know if business is for me. And I'm like, is this a temporary burnout or is really entrepreneurship either not meant for you ever or is it just this season of life? You know, I had, um, I just saw one of my coaching clients from years ago. She's killed it in business. But then she decided as her kids got older, she goes, I just want to take some time off. And she went back to working a regular part-time job for the revenue, you know, to have the money coming into the home. And she was really concerned about how that would look like failure. I was like, girl, you are succeeding beyond majority of people, entrepreneurs that I even work with because you had the self-awareness to say, this is what I need to do. 100%. Now I'm going to drop a little bomb on you. Oh God. In 12 years of being self-employed and launching these, I've never once ever experienced burnout, not one time. And because of my self-awareness yeah. of when I need to pivot, how mentally strong I am by focusing on my self-development yep. and time management skills, right? You have to be good at managing your time and your tasks in your business. Yep. And like you said, her self-awareness of where she needed to go next. Mm -hmm. Never have I experienced that burnout. So when people do, those are the things that we've got to ask them. Do you truly just not enjoy what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Are you really bad at time management? Mm -hmm. Or are you not burnt out? You just really need to make a shift. That's it. The majority of entrepreneurs that I work with, it's not because they're not cut out for be, to be entrepreneurs. They just need the tools and skills to be able to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Which is why I love totally. it. Right? Yeah. And we're almost yeah. therapists sometimes. <laughs> I know. I know. My therapist would be like, you're providing <laughs> no way. No, call others, yourself please. that. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. All right. We've gone through this whole journey. Started with, you know, nursing to photography, the studio And then also doing your clothing line coming out. Is there anything you would change out of that? I mean, you didn't really have burnout, but is there something you look back and go, oh, I really wish I would have changed? Or is it not really worth even looking back to go? "Eh." 
I would have, there's one thing I can think of. Now, obviously with experience comes knowledge and wisdom. So it's not like you can fault yourself in the beginning for being a little bit messier, right? But I really would have written out a business plan in the beginning. That's my number one advice for new business owners or people who are building newer businesses on top of whatever. You have to have a business plan that you revisit every quarter. I was getting ready to say that. Go ahead. Yep. (laughs) And then annually. Yeah. And this business plan, it is the worst exercise. I hate every second of it. I do not enjoy the process of writing on a business plan. But Mm -hmm. had I done that in the beginning, I would have had a clearer idea of where my business was going and where I wanted it to go. And you would have gotten there quicker, I think. Yes. Yeah. I was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. I was that let's just see what happens person. (laughs) And luck came into play. I got lucky. And not everyone has that. But if everyone has a business plan that they revisit every quarter, make adjustments as they need to annually, where you want to be a year from now? Mm -hmm. What are those numbers? What does it look like for you? How many hours a week are you investing? Da, 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 da then you will have a much clearer idea and picture of the efforts Mm -hmm. that you're putting in and how to get there. So that's the one thing I would say. One thing I'll add to that, when we start using, and I I have my MBA, I went to business school. I'm still a toss of whether I think that was a good investment or not, (laughs) because I've learned more out in the real world than I think I ever learned. (laughs) It's a very expensive picture for my wall. Yes. Uh, yeah. It doesn't actually, it's in the basement somewhere. I don't even know where oh. our diplomas are at this point, but that's yeah. okay. But okay. I think though, when people say business plan, they automatically think, oh, business school, SWOT analysis. And I do think that there's a time and place for very structured business plans. Um, for me, almost, if you're one of those that's so viscerally repulsed about the idea of a business plan, start with defining just some very key basics. And you kind of just listed, but like, what is my life like now, right? I had a business plan going into 2020. We all know what happened in 2020. I ended up virtual learning with five kids. My -hmm. business plan went out the window. So we had to revamp it anyways, right? So what is my business, what's my season, I'm sorry, my life, my season of life right now, and how does my business fit into that? Yes, I'm at a place now that I'm able to put the, you know, the business stuff, or I'm sorry, the family stuff before the business stuff, but if I find it sometimes with burnout and, and even when I have felt burnout through my um, career as an entrepreneur is when I've been trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. I haven't stopped to do the reevaluation like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. So just start very simplistic with like, what does my life look like right now? And I'm glad you said that quarterly, especially if you have kids and they get older or you may be a caregiver for a family member or something life changes and you need to, and that's the beauty of being an entrepreneur is that we get to do that. We don't have to ask a boss to do it for us. Yeah, exactly. And it is, that takes a lot of self-discipline to complete this business plan, but I'm telling you guys, you'll see way more correct direction and correct movement forward when you do that. At least just start getting something on paper. Don't feel like you have to go find this crazy, you know, we have a workbook that I use with my coaching clients on this, but it doesn't have to be, here's your SWOT analysis. Here's this, Mm -hmm. here's that. Those all have their own time and place, I think. But if you're just getting into this and just dipping your toe into the business planning aspect, don't overwhelm yourself because you're going to hate the process. Well, the first one I did, I Googled easy business plan template. That was it. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I do know what I need to do this. And there are the great templates out there for you. And if it's too hard, skip the questions you don't know the answer to yeah. or skip that piece. But no one's writing thing. it. <laughs> no, yeah, no, this is for you. So yeah, it's, it's a really good exercise though. Um, and yeah, no one's going to critique it. It's for you. So just do it. It's, it's a great, it's a great exercise and a practice to do regularly. One last question for you. One of my regrets, which of course is a little different because of the time that we got into business. I regret not getting a business coach or mentor sooner. I'm still kind of struggling with getting a solid one. I take pieces from different people that I learn. There's not like one key place. Did What did your education journey look like as you were building your different businesses? You know, that's kind of tough because I don't have one business mentor. <clears throat> But I do look at people who are impacting lives in the way that I want to, and I take everything I can from them. But I will say the one person I've learned the most from in the last 18 months that has been instrumental in my business practice and mindset is Todd Duncan. Are you familiar with Todd? 
Mm-mm. He has been a virtual mentor of mine that I finally met uh, back in September. And he has the practicalities. He has the focus on relationships. He has all of it in this beautifully executed delivery. Mm-hmm. And had I known who he was five years ago, I think that that would have changed a lot of things for me back then. Mm-hmm. So I think when you're looking for a business mentor, you have to be open to learn. You have to be coachable, first of all. Coachable is huge. You have to. You have to be willing to listen to what other people are doing. You have to be willing to celebrate other people in their wins and and, and watch what they do and duplicate it. And you have to be willing to always be a student. So you have to be open to that. And I think when you're like in the beginning, we're not open to that because we're like in survival mode. We're in hustle yes. mode. We are in like, I've just got to make this hundred dollars right now mode. You're not looking for a mentor. Mm-hmm. So I think doing that right off the bat is just being open to paying attention, following those people that, that you know are making a difference in other people's lives and then being willing to not just take what they say, but execute it. Yeah. And it's hard to say, maybe I wouldn't have been as open to it in the beginning because we were so stuck in that hustle mode. But for anyone who's listening to this, who's maybe a new entrepreneur, start looking at those, those business coaches or those mentors and ask yourself, who's where I want to be and Mm -hmm. how can I learn from them? And ask yourself that early on. And I think that you'll start to be more open to, and those things will come to you and you'll be able to learn from them. I think there's great value in that survival mode, that whole baptism by fire, trying to Mm -hmm. figure it out Mm -hmm. because you learn about you. And of course, like Mm -hmm. you learn about yourself through the whole process, as long as you're open to it. But I definitely think in the beginning it's, and this is where another area I think there's a disservice with so much information out there now Mm -hmm. is because there's so many business coaches, many who've never run a business before that are teaching to run a business. Um, (laughs) Yeah. There's so much out there and it's easy for you to start, warping what you really want of your real business, your real life to look like based on what someone else is doing. I think you need to have a good, and this kind of goes back to the business planning and, you know, figuring out why you got into entrepreneurship and what you want from it, going through that process a bit first, and then start looking at the mentors and coaches. I just, I see so many, and maybe it's a, maybe it's a survival thing. Oh my God, my family needs the money. I've seen this person's already done it. Let me just learn directly from them. But I yeah. haven't really seen that work 100% of the time for entrepreneurs. They typically come back and go, that's not really what I wanted. The beauty is they can change it. But what was was time lost in that? Yeah, I would say when you feel like you've hit a wall in your business, that means it's time to level up. Yeah. So for the people who feel like they've hit that wall and they're not sure how to move forward, that's when you want that business mentor like in your life right then. There's and a lot you can do on your own, but then. Yes. And not your mom. Not nope. your best friend, nope. not your partner. It really mm-hmm. needs to be an objective person. And I typically have a water bottle. The way I look at it is like the Starbucks cup. When I'm standing inside, I can't read the label. It's all backwards mm-hmm. for me, right? If it says Starbucks, it would all be backward and just yeah. joins it for me. That's your perspective. If it's just you or people that are close to you trying mm-hmm. to give advice because it's all biased, right? Yeah. Whereas yeah. on the outside, me as a coach, I'm looking at it and I can clearly read and see what you're doing, what's going on and pair my experience with that to give you advisement. Yeah, true. So true. So in my little Starbucks cup, always I get. <laughs> my uh, emotional support cup. <laughs> all right. We have gone through so much information. Is there anything else that you want to, and this is Honestly, great. I mean, y'all, we didn't script this out. It just was organic. We're able to share. As you can see, Sarah and I are very similar in our teachings and our journey. Is there anything that you were missing that the audience may want to know? I can't think of anything in particular. Mostly, I want people to know that I really do believe there is a business owner, a successful entrepreneur inside of everyone. You just have to find what makes you want that more than anything else. So I know that being discouraged in entrepreneurship is a very common, common emotion. But I hope that when people listen to things like this, they know I was not a born entrepreneur. I was not a born leader. I went to school to be a nurse and I was very meek and mild one at that for many, many years. You can become a successful business owner if you're willing to learn, if you're willing to throw yourself in a new situation, you see opportunities as what they are and you just kind of go for it. It's an empowering thing to see that grit and what you're truly made of. 
and showing up, imperfectly mm-hmm. showing up. Mm-hmm. And I always tell people, when you don't show up, it's you telling yourself no. Because you're, yes. you're you're afraid to show up and people reject you. It's probably not going to happen. I mean, you're going to yeah. get no's in business, but you've already given the ultimate rejection of all if you don't show up at all. Mm-hmm. Yep. People don't know what they don't know. And yeah. if you're not going to tell them, somebody else will. And then you'll wish that that had been you. So, yeah, yeah I get it. Love it. Well, guys, I will drop all the links for Sarah's stuff. You have to check out her Instagram. I absolutely love it. I sit for hours oh, and just yes. watch her stuff. That Thank sounded you. way less creepier in my head. <laughs> <laughs> but it's absolutely wonderful. We'll drop that. And we look forward to see the clothing line. So when that comes out, I would love to be able to share that so yeah. that the everyone listening can see the fruits of all the labor and the journey and lessons that you've learned. Thank you so much for coming on. And I hope everyone, this was Real Biz Talk. My name is Rachel Branke. Please jump into the Facebook group. We'd love to have you. If you have any additional questions, you know, just drop it wherever you're watching this video. And I'll see if we can go over to Sarah or if I can help answer them because we really do love business. We love entrepreneurs and we believe that you guys can succeed. Thank you so much. Bye guys. Bye.